Thank you. Uh, when I started to think about this event, I couldn't decide what to talk about. My daughters were incredulous. Talk about something you know, but I don't know anything. <laughs> oh, come on, Mom. Then I decided, OK, I guess nonviolence is it. And I remembered one of my mother's favorite expressions. We spend the first half of our lives taking orders from our children, and the second, no, the first half of our lives taking orders from our parents, and the second half taking them from our children. So that worked. I need nonviolence in my life. I, of course, we all do. I teach it, I talk about it, and I talk to young people nationally and internationally. So that means I have to keep learning, study, read, so that it's fun, so that it's interesting, and it's accessible. So the concept is complex and multilayered and runs counter to the overarching focus on violence in our world, our nation, our communities, and our homes. Detractors abound, challenging the numerous perspectives, talking about the failures, it's cowardly, any number of critiques of the process. And the more I thought about it, the more I knew I needed to reconfigure, to restate my vows, as it were, so that I would stop being despondent and disappointed and disturbed by the violence we see and talk about all the time. So in this, I won't talk about, I won't analyze nonviolence in a sweeping way. I just want to talk about the little rocks in my life that created avalanches. And I'm here to talk about it as I have come to know. And I have to throw in that Sophia on Golden Girls says the truth of being wise is if you've seen everything twice. And I certainly have. So Little Rock's my hometown. I grew up in the American Southern segregated South. The water fountains, restrooms, lunch counters, buses, housing, recreation, and everything else were my lived ex experiences. They weren't abstractions. I resented it. I resented segregation. But I was conditioned, just like everybody else, that it was the way things were. What I knew, what I know now, and what I didn't know then, about the nonviolent resistances practiced in families and communities against what Dutch sociologist Philomena Esset calls everyday racism. Living unequal, parallel lives with whites, but coddled and protected by our families, our church, the perfect illusion of safety. So my mom signed her name Mrs. W.B. Brown, so nobody would call her by her first name. Mothers made their children's clothes so they wouldn't be embarrassed in the stores. Librarian at the Colored Branch, and I use that, that's because that was what it was called, had a small stack of books for me every Saturday when I went there. And no matter what, I held it so I didn't have to go to the colored women's restroom in the basement. I was surely aware of the white ladies' restroom on the upper floors. And I remember the delicious lunches my family packed when we went on a trip, car trip, train trip, and when we went to my parents' rural homes we made black walnut ice cream and had delicious blackberry pies. Despite the fact that they cared about us and protected us, truth 
seeped through and scared me. When I was six, oh my God, after school, I waited with a group of girls for the bus. I was tossing my bus there up and catching it in my mouth. Well, you know what happened. I swallowed it. <laughs> the bus driver yelled, you don't have your fare, so you can't get on this bus. No one had an extra nickel, so I was expected to stand there, a little girl with no way to get home. A black woman from the back of the bus said, I'll pay for you, baby. And I did get on the bus. Our parents knew we experienced hurt now and then, so they tried to make our lives as full as possible. So yeah, my mom was a brownie leader. I went to Y camp and Girl Scout camp. But at the end of the summer, after the white girls were done, and we were taught etiquette by the miscolored spirit of cotton. And we learned dance lessons from an Arthur Murray dancer who came there. There was even a Dick Clark-like television show for those of the colored kids. It didn't matter that I didn't have images of black beauty. I was told beauty is Pretty is, as pretty does. So I knew what my responsibility was. And then I remember when our family was on a drive, we got stopped by the police for something, a tail light. And I was horrified when my six foot two, deep voice father lapsed into the subservient Negro, head down many times, yes sir, yes sir. I hated him for that. But then I guess my own sons hated me when I gave them the black boy talk on how to survive police. They're to have their hands visible, be polite, and be even docile if necessary. It didn't work for my one son, who was beaten by police severely, but he was charged with assaulting them. So when we had court, I filled the courtroom with respectable looking citizens. I can't say they were really respectable, but they certainly looked respectable. <laughs> and they stared silently at the judge. My son was acquitted. Hooray for guerrilla theater! <laughs> so I was 14 when Mamie Till gave us the images of her son, Emmett Till. He was murdered in Mississippi. My world shattered because we were the same age. He was 14 and I was 14. And the children were kept close to home counsel to be careful when we were out and to get home before dark. My mother always assured me of really cool things. She said, the fantastic worlds you read about exist outside this place, and you are sure to experience them when you escape. I was fascinated by the Montgomery bus boy boycott and really heard the words nonviolence for the first time. People walked for a year in nonviolent protest. But those words were coming into my consciousness. In the spring of 1957, my two best friends and I decided we wanted to go to Central High and indicated our desire by signing up at our school. By September, we were apparently qualified. In a couple of meetings with school authorities, they said, you can't participate in any extracurricular activities. And I thought, they've not heard my singing voice. 
They don't know what good athletes Jefferson and Carlotta are. Oh, this is going to change really quickly once they get to know us. They also warned us that there might be some cat calls, but we were not to respond. Cat calls? Why? The reason I wanted to go there was to destroy that outrageous practice and expected my classmates to be as curious as I was. Well, maybe not so much. So on the morning of September 3rd, nine black kids showed up. The older I get, the more I know that showing up is important. We were squeezed between the Arkansas National Guard, who blocked our entrance, and a screaming mob. On that day, I understood violence, and I understood nonviolence. Never to forget. You know, adversaries are the best teachers of nonviolence. By their actions, they made our composed dignity constrained and silent, even courageous, despite the fact that we were shaking in our boots. They didn't care that the whole world was watching. So in February 1958, we got our first formal training of nonviolence. And Reverend James Lawson, who was the nonviolence guru, said that nonviolence is practical, spiritual, practical, and creative. And I thought, creative, yes, that's what I like. And those explanations really hit me, this small town black girl. And I was given ways to understand resistance. I hung on to the word creative. My nonviolence resistance was simple. I saluted, I smiled, my beaming smile, and I walked the halls like I belonged there. I did make some mistakes. I dropped chili on two boys, OK? <laughs> and I warned kids. I don't think it was an act of violence, but whatever. But <laughs> I think we resolved it that it wasn't. But I warn kids, be careful what you do at 16, because it's going to follow you the rest of your life. So I did commit a, a violent act. I called. Some girls were attacking me, and I called them a name. Names are violence. We have to understand that. And for that, I was expelled. Oh, by a quirk of fate, I was exiled to the world I'd only imagined or read about before. So in the 60s, I was in, arrested for sitting in, all kinds of wild stuff, boycotts, marching. And we talked about nonviolence all the time. And we talked about our willingness to die for freedom. Oh, the audacity of youth. Nonviolence was in our hearts and in our hands. OK, I'll tell you some other resistances. My mom allowed our dining room table to be the space where organizing was argued and strategized by my brother Bobby and my sister Phyllis. The house was under constant surveillance and threat. So what did my mom do? She cooked big pots of beans and cornbread for the young people around the table. So I do some work with a, an organization called Soldier to the Past. And part of that is teaching nonviolence. There are a number of projects that have happened by the students. I've taught nonviolence to more than 7,000 teachers and parents. So today, and I was happy that young people had that information in order to negotiate their survival in a violent world. Today, I'm fascinated and invigorated by the protesters around the country, such as Black Lives Matter, immigration, global warming, LBG issues and other situations we need to fix. 
The creativity of the die-ins, the slogans, are music to my ears. Bree, you and your group who liberated that Confederate flag couldn't be more nonviolent and creative. Just showing up is what you did. I wanted, my daughter posted on Facebook pictures of her protests against police brutality. Can you believe I wanted her to take the post down? I was afraid for her. I wanted her out of harm's way. I am ashamed of my reaction. I had to understand that her protests were about her life. I'm inspired by the current day protesters. I admire their creative efforts. I want them to succeed in keeping nonviolence front and center on behalf of us all. When I looked in my daughter's eyes, I saw myself reflected her hope for a better future, a nonviolent world. I witnessed that same spark in the eyes of Malala, a Pakistani teacher who was shot in the face for trying to go to school. I was a part of a tribute to her at the National Constitution Center. As I developed my speech, I realized I too had experienced violence for trying to go to school, right up the street at Central High School. I understood her fervor, her insistence for the right of education. I hope as we grow older that we remember that spark in our own eyes, that we remember our hopes and dreams. Unfortunately, it falls on the shoulders of the young people to remind us. When we breathe, we breathe together. Thank you very much. <laughs>